started, and I know that uh, um, my Matt Kaplan, who's right over here, uh, has a lot to cover, so I'm going to do a very brief introduction. I think that we've provided some introductory work. Um, I will just say that when I began uh, here at Cornell a number of years ago, well, one of the first projects I did was in the area of intergenerational programming. Um, and even though that was a while ago, Matt Kaplan's work was already uh, really well established in the area, and I think I can honestly say that as someone who has advanced this area of how do we connect uh, older people and younger people together in meaningful ways, which of course is an enormously high priority. Of, uh, we're entering an aging society with a lot of young people who aren't really prepared for it. And, and I would say that uh, the Matt's work has cut across actually developing individual programs, including through extension uh, and through forays, but also looking more broadly at the nature of intergenerational connections and policies. Uh, it, it, um, in terms of nuts and bolts, Matt has a PhD in environmental psychology, is that right? Uh, and has been, um, and is a, a, a long-term professor at Penn State, which we in the College of Human Ecology always feel close to. Um, when graduate students arrive in the fall, they used to put up a sign, Welcome to Penn State, <laughs> because um, so many people apply to those programs. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, with that as intro, uh, Matt, it's great to have you with us. And, uh, okay. Thank you. thank you, Carl. Uh, got in last night. Really, uh, nothing could be more perfect. Everything was great, even the lights in my favor, <laughs> stop signs. Um, at any rate, uh, it's great to be here uh, talking about my favorite topic, uh, it's generational studies. So I'm really going to zero in on the physical environment of, this, of this generational work. I understand we have a very diverse crowd, and that you're here because you're interested, not just for the free lunch, right? <laughs> OK. Uh, so my, my own background, uh, I have maybe 30 seconds to do this. I'll just uh, born on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, hung out a lot, <laughs> educational alliance into settlement houses, seeing how powerful that was for youth development, including myself. Uh, so decided to go into psychology, SUNY at Stony Brook, right? then behavioral psych. Then I hooked up with uh, Len Krasner, who was uh, one of the developers of token economy, but then, token economies, but then he went into developing utopian environments, talking about instead of changing the individual. So he really became quite uh, out there and, you know, very powerful guy in that moving behavioral psych alone. So, and then uh, environmental psych at CUNY, and then from there, my dissertation, we looked at intergenerational strategies for community building. And then from, from there, really looking at all kinds of intergenerational work, and luckily over the last uh, seven or so years, getting back to looking at the environment. So I feel like I'm like an environmental psychology person again. Okay, well, it's a little bit more than 30 seconds. So we have to start. Oh, um, being that we only have like 45 minutes for me to talk, and we really want to open it up to your questions and experiences, um, I'm handing out a, a background paper on intergenerational contact zones, uh, some work that came out of a meeting at Oxford uh, summer before last. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit, but uh, it's some reference material you can take a look at. If anyone, uh, since we're going to talk a lot about objects and sites, if anyone feels inclined, we have a board over there with markers. If you want to help operationalize or share some images of some of the stuff we're talking about, just zoom right up there. We want to make it as far as possible in 40 minutes. All right, so here we go. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about what, what I would call and what we would call maybe an intergenerational perspective, um, just very broadly, and then talk about intergenerational contact zones as a concept, and also some of its uh, programming implications uh, and some of the insights we're able to get as far as using that uh, for designing environments. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about objects, like the microenvironment. I think uh, a lot of the uh, themes really uh, become very, uh, very strongly seen when you look at the micro things you could hold. And then I'm going to talk about intergenerational environments and more in a, a community, con community settings context. All right, so when we use the word intergenerational, basically there are like unlimited possibilities. We, 
people studying their community, learning about horticulture, playing together, creating things together, sharing their lives together. So it really is a huge thing. I tend to see it as one field, um, a field of study and practice. Uh, there are some common themes that cut across these different areas. Uh, and also, in my mind, if we look at it as an intergenerational studies field, uh, what's interesting is not so much the intergenerational word. It's what it's applied for, and we can look at why, why uh, intergenerational relationships and interventions, actually efforts to uh, facilitate different kinds of engagements, make sense. They make sense in a healthy human development kind of way in terms of uh, providing people with uh, social connectedness, stimulation uh, that we need across the lifespan. Uh, in the family context, particularly with families that are uh, broken or uh, struggling in different ways, uh, community development, community participation, very strong theme, thrust. And then uh, increasingly these days we have like anthropologists and other people studying, uh, studying societies and they talk about intergenerational uh, links uh, across generations as being really key for cultural continuity. And some community people talk about intercultural conflict and intergenerational strategies for addressing that. So it really cuts across, but again, I see it as one large field. Um, we're going to talk about settings, intergenerational settings and the environment, but um, I guess the theme I'm going to keep getting back to is that it's not just environment, it's just not just design. The, the best um, settings really, you see some uh, alignment in terms of, I guess, the four P's and the V. The four P's, so here we have programs, but really great partnership, great partnerships, programs and policies and the places are aligned with those things and the values for what that setting is trying to accomplish. All right, so I'll be talking that up and you'll see what I mean. All right, first just to clarify a few, a few words. Uh, sometimes people get confused, not so much with the word monogenerational and intergenerational, but multi-generational and intergenerational. We just have to get that clear really fast, okay? All right, so far I'm going to show you a few images. I'm going to ask you what you think they are, mono, multi, or intergenerational, okay? You ready? All right, keep eating. Good. All right, first image. So what do you think this is, these are? Uh, would, you, would you characterize this as mono, multi, or inter? Okay, uh, the answer is, it's none of those. <laughs> I was going to say none of those. You none of you, I know you're out of the box. Don't be shy, Carl. All right, anyway, so I call it no-no generational. So there's, there's not any room for people at all. So, I mean, yes, the security, the, the values that, that uh, influence the design of the space is security and safety and so on. It's not people-oriented. So um, here we go. We get towards like an open space which is more mono-generational, so more like set up for, uh, for adult, adult play, right? Originally I had a little fence around here, around this uh, statue, and some people said it looked like a, a zoo. <laughs> Other people said it looks like uh, kids would have fun climbing the fence. Anyway, so this isn't perfect, but just in general, we thought this is more of a mono-generational thrust. Now here's a park scene with different age people. And uh, it's not a perfect distinction between multi and, and, mon and inter, but multi just means there, there, are, there are things to do and a place intended for different generations. So like, you know, like universal design, creating an environment where people can be there. But, you know, many ways, many times it's parallel coexistence. The word intergenerational really refers to when you're intentionally designing uh, programs, places, um, and policies that facilitate engagement. So something like this. So here we go more towards intergenerational. So we have a lot of activities which are designed for entire families. And even the sandbox is an office. So not, not, the adults don't need to dive into the sand. <laughs> they have actually a place to sit. So there is a little universal design there, but they're facing each other. They're not facing apart. And not everything has to be intergenerational. They you know, they're also able to withdraw to watch and interact. So it's really uh, more of an intergenerational setting. 
All right, so I just passed out a, uh, the uh, its generational contact zones piece. I think this concept is, uh, I think it's really kind of key and we'll, we'll talk about it, but I see it as a tool um, in several ways. First, uh, it's a conceptual tool for studying and understanding multi-generational settings. So in many cases, there are multi-generational settings and people say, how do we make it more intergenerational? So how would, how would people meet? Where would they meet? Why would they meet? And how does it meet their needs? And how is it consistent with the settings all about? Oh, also, by the way, the, I forgot to mention the intergenerational studies area. It really, it's over 30 years um, in the literature. It's a big thing. Well, I like to think it's a big thing. Um, but it was mostly dominated by like psychology types, social work, and so on. So people really talking about engagement outside of the physical context. So um, here, it's very valuable talking about spaces and places and contact zones to get people to think spatially and say, oh, yeah, it's not enough to talk about mentoring relationships. And, you know, well, how would people meet? Where would they meet? And how do you uh, create neutral spaces and opportunities? So the, the environment has to be considered in the context of aligning it with programs and so on. Okay, and I think uh, design, people, so people who do programs really would get a lot of insight and find some benefit from this, these themes. And designers, in many, well, not, not in this university, but in many places, you have designers who design, uh, well, don't necessarily take human factors into account so much. But not in this university, because you have uh, such uh, integrated views, those of you who do design, I see. Okay, so I'm just critical of some designs I've seen that have been aesthetics oriented not necessarily human factors, and not necessarily human interaction context in the environment. So it's really like a meeting place between those who do intergenerational uh, intervention work and people who design settings. Okay, so this compendium of uh, what I handed out, intergenerational contact zones, uh, we had a meeting on it. We invited lots of people. It was during a sabbatical I had at uh, Oxford with their uh, Institute of Population Aging, and we were just exploring what is this concept of intergenerational contact zones, what might it mean? So we were, people were talking about it. Uh, we had anthropologists there, gerontologists, youth development, uh, international <coughs> studies, very, very diverse group. So we're trying to figure out what is the concept, and then what really, I think, uh, made it become real to me was that we pulled together a compendium of applications which we put online, and the URL, the website, is on the cover of what I handed out. What I handed out has the table of contents, the first chapter, a couple of other chapters, and the conclusions for some of the endpoints. Um, and we're about to uh, make it into a formal book and expand it. If any of you have uh, chapters to write for that, uh, now's the time to let me know after. Okay, but what's really interesting is that we didn't really define it so much. I mean, I think we included an appendix that shows the multiple dimensions uh, of looking at contact zones, the, the psychological, what's going on, individual meaning, shared meaning, uh, the political, the spatial. I mean, so those two pages at the, in the, at the end kind of really de define or uh, clarify the conceptual framework. Um, but what was interesting, how people applied it in different ways. One I mean, one guy, one person is doing, uh, a couple of people doing parks, you know, looking at how parks function in terms of whether they could be great intergenerational sites. Someone else is repurposing castles. I mean, that means a historical landscape architect. He wrote a chapter. I mean, you know, someone else has an intergenerational school. You know, so it's just really, uh, it was very rich. And uh, so we tried to draw some themes across and try to figure out what the it is. Okay, the, my favorite chapter, my favorite chapter is bus stops as intergenerational contact zones. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> this one is really amazing. Uh, this guy, Jason Danely, I don't know if you know his name, but he's into uh, anthropology and aging. In fact, he's editor of a journal, online journal, journal called Anthropology and Aging. Does a lot of Japan studies. Um, really into place-making kinds of concepts. At any rate, he was in the meeting, and he left the meeting, kind of really into it, picked up his seven-year-old son. They're walking home, they're walking to the bus station, and this kid says, hey, Dad, what did you do? What did you do today? He says, yeah. Well, and he explained all about intergenerational contact zones. So the seven-year-old is trying to get his mind about it, around that concept. 
So we said, oh, well, you mean like, like what this bus stop is that we're waiting at? Like how can it be a good place for generations to connect and so on? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's it. And they started talking. And, uh, and he started eliciting, well, he, the seven-year-old didn't need much eliciting, but he started sharing his, his insights as to how this bus stop could become an ideal uh, contact zone. I think we have a couple of seats over here. There's this seat over here. Please come on in. Seat over here. Oh, a few more over here. Okay, so, so what this seven-year-old boy, uh, Aiden, started designing, so here's what a bus stop tends to look like in the Oxford area. I couldn't find one that I didn't have to pay like hundreds of dollars for. So it's something really, it's just like a non-place. And people are there as though they're in limbo, just waiting for the bus. So the kids started designing a chess set game that would be uh, basically playable through a hologram that anyone can start the game and people can watch it and you can stop the game when you want and continue on later on. And he's developing this really rich, rich way to convert this into a community building place. Why? I mean, he asked this kid, and then, I mean, just in this article, I just want to read a little passage. Uh, so as the kid starts to sketch it, the dad says, well, I'm not so sure I know what you mean, try to sketch it. It's a little hard to follow the sketch. I have a difficult time. But the words kind of explain it. The scene is lively and people are engaged. There are things to occupy the time and, more importantly, the imagination, which seeps out beyond the game itself and into the spaces and relationships around it. For a child, the game is all-encompassing. It's not about simply about some task, but it's about creating a cultural world where anyone can join in. Older people and, newer, and children can teach each other about new technology and ancient strategy. Onlookers might become players as a bus arrives and disrupts the game. Some might even appear when they don't have a bus to catch. There are chances for encounters, both subtle and dramatic. The idea that all of this could happen at the most mundane of public spaces didn't seem odd at all from the point of view of a seven-year-old. Now, what if some seven-year-olds and some 70-year-olds collaborated with designers and social scientists? I mean, so for me, where I'm thinking on the track, what are the principles of intergenerational contact zones? And we include like a list of principles and themes, but it really opened me up to think, I need to find the kid inside of myself and think about it as play, think about curiosity, discovery, fun, and, get, and not be stuck on this, on this phrase that we love in the academy, evidence-based research, because they're generating some great ideas. We could do some evidence-based research to look at different concepts and how people respond, but what are you going to say to the seven-year-old who has this incredible idea? Sorry. Uh, where are your credentials? Is this evidence-based? You can't do that. So you have, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, a different way to, to respond. So it had a big impact on me, just to share that. Okay, now, what do you think of uh, these objects? Now I'm going to start talking about objects, okay? Uh, what do you think these three objects have in common? <laughs> All right, there's milk and cookie. There's a PA loud system sound system, and then there's that, there's that restraining device that cancels. Uh, anyone want to give it a try? What do they have in common? Okay, you give up. It's a tough one. Dr. Kaplan? <laughs> okay, so they are fantastic, meaning-packed, intergenerational engagement-inducing objects. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you quick stories about those three things. They couldn't be more apart, but each one, you see, wow, that really is phenomenal for the particular context in which it's in. They really do generate some, some unique and powerful intergenerational engagement. And uh, I don't have anything with technology here, but um, I'll talk about it a little later on. I think people who know technology and hybrid environments, augmented environments, that's uh, that's phenomenal area that uh, we're hoping to include in some of this. Okay, so all these objects, they're meaningful. They're deemed meaningful by the participants. And also there's a shared social meaning uh, piece. So um, so it's not just the objects interested for individual, interesting individuals, but there's a shared meaning. And they activate some sort of an intergenerational bonding process. 
Also, they're tied in with the, with the context, the social context, uh, the values of society, institutional policies, and so on, and they stimulate a certain amount of curiosity and exploration. Okay, first, milk and cookies. Um, so, um, I was in Japan on a sabbatical, 1994 to 95. Um, sabbatical from Hawaii, Pacific University, that's where I was at the time. Um, visiting uh, retirement, uh, an assisted living, uh, facility, but it's mostly more on the independent living side. Uh, and this facility really embraced intergenerational connections. In fact, it was kind of a well-to-do area. They uh, opened their pool up to the community. Kids are there. You could hear kids laughing. I mean, and also they donate to some international children's aid societies and so on. Anyway, what they do, being that they're between a housing area residential community and the school that kids go to, they leave the front door and back door open, and at the entrance is a piano, and on top of the piano they put milk and cookies. So um, the kids, they all love to go through it, back and forth from school, and as the kids walk through, they enjoy the milk and cookies, and the seniors kind of descend upon them. They talk, they hang out, and you could even see like uh, other kinds of engagement, like the kids doing pounding shoulders, like after school, and then they're laughing, they're talking, very natural. Now, you look at this and you say, wow, milk and cookies, that's the object. I've got to put milk and cookies into every retirement home in the world. That, I think that would be missing it. I mean, I guess you could call it the spider web approach or, or whatever. Somebody might say, well, those chocolate chip cookies, is it the oatmeal that works? But remember what I said, <laughs> would oatmeal work as well? But it's the, you have to look at the context of alignment. Does it fit into the setting? So this community, the normative framework of it was that seeing kids, engaging kids, and so on is part of what the essence of living here is. People who advertised this, who signed up, new people to come into the house, felt like this is really good. We want this. Okay, so that's the context there. Uh, this one, uh, St. Anne's Intergenerational Center in Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee, which is in Wisconsin. Okay, so for those of you who are probably from New York City, like I'm from, so they didn't really study geography. Um, <laughs> in the middle of the country somewhere. <laughs> um, it's a great place. They have uh, care for all, all ages and all situations. They have this thing uh, with, the early, with the infant care room where uh, if there are more than one baby crying at a time and the staff is overwhelmed, uh, they go to the uh, PA system and they set an alarm saying, rock a -bye alert, rock a -bye alert. And people from all over the facility, including some assisted living people, daycare, assisted daycare, they uh, all go there, and some of them actually run over, and whoever, the first two people there get to rock the baby. <laughs> it sounds too good to be true. I saw, I saw a little video clip of it, like a promotional thing. There's two people, talk, elderly people, talking in the <laughs> rocking chairs, telling about their stories, and then you hear the rock a baby alert. One's a man, one's a woman. The guy looks up and he says, oh, there's a rock of baby alert. And he looks over and the woman is gone, just her seat is going like that. I mean, it's so powerful, the concept. But I never thought about sound and the messages of sound as part of the, I mean, just to carry possibility, connection possibility. It's really powerful. Uh, this one is an idea from that guy I mentioned, the castle repurposing work. Um, try, you know, many times, uh, I used to think of castles only romantically, but in, in many cases, uh, he was, he's in uh, Galway, Ireland. He does a lot of work around there, and that's the castle on the right is from Galway. I mean, a lot of the times these places are really, you know, run down, unused, and I mean, they're like there's bottles on the floor. I mean, it's just not really a, a great place. People kind of go in there for not such great reasons. So there's a movement to try to, you know, engage the community in these places, and there's potential to have people learn about their cultural history, cultural pride. And so on, but how do you get people there? How do you? So at any rate, uh, this object, it seems like the most anti-interactive -in thing you can imagine. Can you imagine going into this thing? <laughs> how are you going to go in there and talk with people? But yet, I believe that families that go there, the first thing, that, come on, Grandpa, let's do this thing. It's going to be kind of cool. So you're side by side. So it's the novel. It's the novel experience. It's the peaking of interest. It's something to do. In some cases, it's the only game in town. So it's a restraining device. But from there, if you, ha if you have somebody trained in intergenerational engagement, they're going to facilitate reflection, discussion, 
and throw in some information that we hand out about the history of castles and really get people to understand these castles are part of our heritage. That this is gold. Many societies around the world are dying for this kind of history. So, so how do we get that discussion started? So we got to think about that. Okay, many other objects generate intergenerational curiosity and engagement. Here's a, a, a memory chest uh, in, a, in an area in a city in the, the Netherlands. Uh, it's basically an assisted living facility. They have a lot of, a lot of visitors from schools they, who want them to talk about the neighborhood history. Some of them are feeling like, gee, we could really use some, uh, some objects to help us, paraphernalia or anything. So they each get a, get a draw in this memory chest and they put some item in there that helps them tell the story of their life in that community. Now some people think, oh, the items must be very valuable, like, you know, jewelry or stuff like that, historical, <clears throat> you know, items, but no, things like a spool of thread. One woman had a spool of thread because that's what she used when she was 10 years old to uh, communicate with a nearby, with a neighboring kid. She was from a Catholic uh, family. He was from a Protestant family. They weren't allowed to play. They un unspooled this full of thread, and they would play tug, and they'd, sh they'd uh, you know, joke and chat under the fence. So to hear that story, the currently, there's a lot of, uh, intercultural tension uh, going on in Europe, in case we haven't been reading the papers. You know, it's all these people from the Middle East coming and there's other tension. So people here, kids hear that, say, oh wow, you mean there was conflict back then? You know, there were some people who hated others even though they're neighbors and now we consider them as okay. So some of these stories are phenomenal. Uh, we, have, we have several people here from 4 H. So on, uh, a lot of youth, youth clubs want to do intergenerational projects. So some of the service. So, oh yeah, there's a, a long-term care place right down the road, but gee, how do we talk to them? How do we get it started? So the principle is uh, you bring something you really care about and, and that'll help you get it started. So here's a miniature horse. I'm pretty sure it's a miniature horse and not a pony. Um, but uh, you know, this small animals club. Well, I don't know if that counts as a small animal, maybe medium-sized animal. <laughs> And uh, it turns out it was like huge. It's there. They all look at the dog or the or the bunny rabbit or the or the miniature horse. They're interacting about it. Oh, what do you do with it? How much is it? And so on. It it just it's a nice non-pressuring, non-judgmental way to get connected. And from there you could do many other things. Okay, and of course dress up. All right, some other objects work pretty well in intergenerational settings. I was just. Uh, reading some history uh, in child, children's environments uh, and came across some of the concepts from Reg Reggio Emilia's approach, talking about how children should have some control over their environment uh, and then a lot of learning is relationship-based learning. So I mean, you can, there's really so much theory in, in child development that would help us uh, give us some clues as to how to develop these settings in intergenerational enhancing kinds of ways. Okay, so I'm going to uh, keep going. I may skip a few, but we'll, we'll take it from there. Oh, also family, family uh, uh, identity, family strength type programs. Um, like Penn State Extension, your extension program here has extensive work with, uh, work with uh, grandparents and other relatives raising children. Uh, it turns out that many of these families struggle. So uh, usually the reason why the generation in the middle is not there what is that, like a four Ds or five Ds? Death, the detention, divorce, drugs, drugs, and AIDS. Well, AIDS also A, but it's death. So, I mean, these are all not so happy. So, and a lot of times it's sudden. So the quest in family strength is how do you rebuild a family sense of family strength? So we, we do, um, I mean, family identity, family traditions, family routines that many families take for granted. So they, you don't just become a family, but you're expected to very suddenly. So it's really an intense area. So we do uh, family uh, uh, retreats. We've been doing a bunch of these around the state. Uh, wrote it up, put it online. And one of the activities that's really good is um, family banners. I think we borrowed this from uh, a curriculum. I think it was from Iowa, and we would use that as well. But a family banner, first the families meet, they talk about, well, what, what are the key themes that um, 
typify our family or that we want to reflect us. So sometimes it's like fun things or it's doing things together or it's uh, growing fruits and vegetables or even mourning together. You know, so they use images. Some, some place, some families have like crosses from the cemetery where they bury their uh, parents or ch adult children. So, but it's a way for them to express themselves, find a way of connection with uh, an identity, and they share that with other families. And it's kind of cool. At the end, they parade their family banners together. A similar activity is like a family crest. You know, like the, uh, in Europe, some of the older families, what's your crest? What does it have? Swords or, or axes or uh, wheat? You know? <laughs> okay, well, anyway, so it's kind of recreating family. Okay, oh, and some of the families have been repeat customers or attendees for these uh, family retreats. And you see some of the themes uh, change over time, getting to be happier, a little less um, uh, into uh, sadness, uh, and more into looking at the future in a hopeful way. So one family had cemetery items, you know, lots of cemetery symbols. And then there were more, there, there, that wasn't necessarily seen down the road, they're looking ahead. Okay. Um, Ah, talk about technology. Uh, example, uh, how many of you here would consider yourselves good at technology? <laughs> a couple of you. Uh, no? Okay, we got a couple, so we know who to ask about it. Um, I, have a I had a grad student who's now on the faculty at Nanyang Technological University uh, in Singapore. And uh, she was in the new media program, and she was really into family connections. So she developed this concept and, and prototype devices of uh, Remember Me Inheritance Kits. So these are items that an elderly relative has. Uh, we showed it on a poster, so I figured it's okay to show publicly. Um, so these are items that uh, people remember their elderly relative from. And they put a chip in, an RFID chip, which you run it over uh, some sort of a base, I understand, and that, that could contain visual and, and uh, like written and pictorial images, even sound, of the person. So it's kind of really cool. It's a way to remember them. And uh, another device she showed, I forget what she called it, was, was something on the wall that, they, uh, that reminds you of the family, and you could just wave or press a button and hear their voice. And probably, I don't think she further developed this as far as she could, because I would imagine, depending on the day you have, let's say you come home with an injury, or you've been uh, humiliated by the other kids in school, um, and you're sad, you need to pick me up. So there's a pick me up button, you press pick me up, and before your elderly rel relative uh, passed away, uh, they actually took the time and effort to give several audio clips on what, on how to, you know, helping you get a sense of your confidence, reminding you that you're special and so on. You get in the feeling this is like so wide open, we're in the ground floor here. So uh, it's really quite interesting. Okay, talk about fun. Uh, we do an Ag Progress Days. I know you have many festivals as well. So one thing we put in the family room, uh, we have done is cooking called the Stump Your Relatives Game. So we have uh, two boxes, one filled with items that kids know, and we have a team of kids helping us come up with items that adults aren't likely to know. Uh, and this is, I did this so long ago. It's like, you can see how long ago Janet Jackson was in this. <laughs> so she, <laughs> you can tell I'm getting a little bit out there. Um, and then older people's items, like a shoehorn and so on, they those still stand, I guess. They, they even get better over the years. But we'd have to change the items here. Uh, but then, and then they stump each other. And they come up, you know, they wait online and they go, this, this is really a lot of fun. So we have that online and we have ways to do that. Uh, even a more intensive way with 4 clubs and so on. Uh, toys. A lot of, uh, turns out in Asia, they really, I mean, I've seen it in Japan. Thailand, there are like toy museums, there are toy clinics, where uh, a toy clinic where you have older adults wearing like lab coats, the kids bring their toys in, <laughs> my toy is broken. So they say, okay, let's, let's take a look, what's wrong with the toy? <laughs> so you have that warmth and everything's going to be okay and they help to rebuild the toy. Anyway, I don't know if we have that in the U.S. I mean, I think people argue as to who's the first to do that particular model. I don't know. I think it's Japan, but then Thailand has been around. I don't think that's the issue. I think we're talking about human development, societal continuity, and so on. Of course, objects in the environment help people, help you to desensitize, desensitize people to the objects that other generations use as paraphernalia. 
So people who research early childhood, they say, you know, a lot of the stereotypes about aging uh, are infused through the messages kids get. But actually, if a kid sees somebody with like a hearing aid, if they could touch it and find out how it works, I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Kind of cool. But yet, we, you know, we get so nervous. Oh, oh, you know, don't ask about that because that may be personal. They may not like. So as far as uh, oh, and also we train people ahead of time, uh, you know, of all ages to be on the same page as staff, the adult volunteers. Okay, so I need to go a little faster. I might skip a few slides, but uh, this one. Look at that dog. So you think any age people are going to love that dog? I saw so I saw the worst use of a service dog in an intergenerational setting. It's like unbelievable. So to make the point about alignment, uh, I'm going to tell you this really quickly. Is when I was in Hawaii, it was an adult care facility and a preschool coming over, and the uh, the head of the uh, child care center. <laughs> invited somebody with their service dog. The dog was really cool. They presented those presentations all over the place about how the dog helps people who, who need a, a, a friendly uh, animal, a friendly being next to them. But what they did was they made everybody sit down for like 40 minutes and listen to this lecture. The dog sitting there, and the kids and seniors are like, especially the kids are dying and so on. At any rate, it turned out that the woman was had to step away for an emergency call or something like that. And then one of the uh, seniors grabbed a stick, and this is in Hawaii, it's pretty open, it's natural, grabs a stick like this, gets the attention of the kids, and the kids get really excited, gets the attention of the dog, and brings everybody outside with the stick and starts throwing the stick, and the dog's return, you know, getting the stick and bringing it back, and it turned into an incredible, incredible event. But here's the point, we don't understand why we're doing this intergenerational thing. If it's uh, if it's disempowering as opposed to empowering, if you don't have a sense of human development, what it's all about, you're really just copying the phenotype. You're not really getting the genotype or the essence of this kind of work and why we do it. In this case, of human development. Of course, the physical environment affects possibilities for interaction. Here's preschool. I mean, this is a badly placed sink. Uh, if it's good for kids, little kids running around, but if you happen to be in a wheelchair, it's rough. So here's a little bit better. Um, but this is just sort of a basic slide. I think it's really also a question about values. How do we design environments? What's important? So here, what's important here, especially with the kid's seat, is that the kid doesn't make such a big mess, right? But yet, you have what some people, the designer of this, of the next slide, he calls it dueling chairs. It's hard to get close. So what did he design? He designed a way, a way to have kids in there. The kid's going to be in there one way or another by throwing food and watching you pick it up. So it turns out this slide, you think everybody wants to do this kind of thing, but it's, it's really hard to get permission to do this kind of thing because the seat, it kind of uh, it could constrict your blood flow, it could create issues, so it's very hard to get permission. It's not so easy. So before you start rushing out and cutting holes in your table, you know, make sure you know what's going on. But it's all in the family, and it's a matter of values. So what are the values for any particular setting that you're interested in adding more human engagement across generations? Uh, symbols and environments uh, offer cues, physical environmental cues. There are some examples. Here's in the uh, grant. You walk into this one shared site or agent's created setting. They have an adult care facility in Japan, adult daycare program in a preschool, and they have this mural. And uh, I forget the exact words, but it's something like like a family, together like a family. That's a message. Uh, we had a program where uh, we were doing work in uh, retirement communities, trying to come up with a model for a, a CPOC, <laughs> continuing care retirement community, to, um, to embrace intergenerational work, not just one model, but actually to help it build capacity to connect with all the children and youth serving organizations in the community, hence the model. So the CCRC is in the middle, all these are, it was like a database, figuring out what all these places were. But what was the message, what was the symbol? The symbol we chose, the name was Generation Station, as opposed to uh, getting everybody, getting all the older people a little far away. It was like, let's make this a station, like Grand Central Station, old style uh, train. This is a place where you want to visit. This is a node of activity. So it reflects the, the value and the goal of that site. 
Okay. Uh, oh, the intergenerational school. Uh, my colleagues, the White Houses. Peter Whitehouse is a neurologist, and his wife Kathy uh, Whitehouse is principal. They opened up the intergenerational school, and now they're replicating it in several different countries. You go to. Uh, it's actually a school, and senior volunteers are involved in many ways. You go to the place where they come in to sign in for their reading with the kids and other mentoring activities, and you see this, an elder's pledge. This is something like 15 or 20 years old, but this is a phenomenal poster. In fact, I ordered one. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of time, but can everybody see this? Can we just skim it over on your own? And it stands true right now. It's like we don't want to be the subject of your experiment. I mean, it's really like an empowering statement. It's such a powerful thing to have in the environment, which is intergenerational. It reminds everyone that they, they have a lot to contribute. So I'll just give you a few seconds to take a look at it. I know you're going to want one, too. Syracuse Cultural something. Workers. They, workers. And they have these. They have postcards. They have posters. Yeah. Has anybody seen this before? Oh, you have. Okay. Cool. Okay. So what are we learning about the intergenerational bonding potential of objects? It's not about the object itself. It's the meaning. It's the opportunities that people have to engage it. It's how the object's position and relationship enhancing ways in terms of the program. Uh, and the policies of the place. It's also about curiosity and discovery, finding objects that could tap into those human qualities and interests. And also, you need to pay attention to context. Okay, I have a question for you. What about this object? Do you think it's a good intergenerational meaning inducing uh, object? I'd assume that it's not actually going to be able to move. <laughs> Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so originally I put it in as a joke. Uh, in case you haven't seen it, it's a catapult, right? And everybody has been wanting to pull their hair out who deals with kids, at least a little bit. One day, maybe. One moment. Let's admit it. Kids can be tough, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so it's like a joke. But then I start thinking, well, first, the role, I include it for the role of humor. You need to, people like to laugh. But actually, this is a good, if you use it in the right way, in a certain way, this is a great object. I just came back from, about a week ago, I went to Ligonier, Pennsylvania, uh, where the Mellons and all those folks live not far from, used to live, uh, from uh, Pittsburgh, and they had a grandparents' game. And one of the items was to a team competition on building catapults, and that teams were intergenerational. And the lucky people had the, had the people who had some engineering background. I mean, so it's a nice task. And also, you could do other stuff. You could, like, make, if, let's say, if you have a little competition or uh, um, somebody's really annoying, some fictional character that you read, you could say, oh, who should we put on this? You know, oh, should we put uh, Stevie, who, like, was mean to his little sister, on the catapult? <laughs> so then the, then the joke is together. They're laughing. They're using it. You see what I mean? It's generating interest. It's generating discussion. So it's not about passive, it's about how do you activate a setting to interact. Okay, a few slides about uh, community uh, participation, community development, civic engagement. Um, I think uh, what's missing in a lot of our institutions for learning about the community, including libraries, museums, uh, and centers and so on, is uh, how to link the historical information with people's current uh, experience and with people's hopes for the future. So there are many ways you could use, uh, you could design activities focused on learning about the community, enjoying it together, and, and designing it together in ways that help people uh, plan the future in ways that are continuous with the past. Intergenerational groups are great for that because older adults have more of a hands-on experience with history, <laughs> right, by definition. Okay, so here's the kazoo, uh, homecoming day at Penn State. We have a kazoo club. Do you have a kazoo club? <laughs> we have one. Okay, so it's the kazoos represent tradition, 100-year-old tradition. And this is a house I saw, uh, a community I saw in uh, England I visited. Uh, they redeveloped this industrial place. They used to produce bricks for roofs of, uh, of houses, but it's long been gone. So they did this massive redevelopment based on a holistic uh, environmental ecology concept. But they just had people live there. There was no sense of history. 
So when it came time to start these uh, block associations, nobody volunteered. Nobody wanted to be a part of it. There was no sense of place or history. So why not have a little like museum or some, some sort of place reminder that this is a place. It's not like, uh, like driving down to Florida. You see Howard Johnson, McDonald's, all that. You forget where you are unless you're, anyway, <laughs> unless you're in Savannah, which is the state. Okay. So um, walk by a talk about. People have places to share. So this is uh, from my, uh, my own dissertation work at CUNY Grad Center. So how do you create activities where people can share their experience and share where they live? This is in Mount Vernon, New York. The school was abandoned. It was a trade school that one of the seniors went to. He's able to tell his story. The kids always walked about around this building and cursed it because it's so big. It's hard to walk around. And here, all of a sudden, it's a place that's meaningful. And this guy, who they thought was like a nobody, they were really not so nice to him. All of a sudden, he became a star. He had a lot to contribute. Uh, this is in Taiwan. This is the, the hundred. This is a hundred-year-old plus tree. They have a hundred-year-old tree club, senior volunteers who tell the story of, well, it's an environmental ed theme, but it's also uh, local history and culture. And they talk also, they tell stories to kids, kids groups, uh, including like ghost stories, mythology of these trees, and so on. So, I mean, so it's the natural environment as well as the built environment. How do you get people interested? How do you get people learning together, sharing together, and planning the future together? Uh, oh, at our Ag Progress Days, we tried once to do a little uh, intergenerational learning hub around environmental education. So uh, we had these uh, uh, questions, different topics about the natural environment that they chose and they share what they know and they, uh, they learn facts together. It did not work because of sound. Sound that I learned so much about before. Turns out there was the food demo area right behind, and it was so loud that this intimate space that we had, we needed something like, let's have some Get Smart, they have a little cone, and it's just no sound. That's what we thought with this thing, it would really create intimacy, but the sound was so loud. Anyway, I'd love to work on that cone, if anybody has engineering ability. Okay, where is this place? This is great, Fayette County in, um, in Pennsylvania one of the poorest counties in the country. It has phenomenal natural resources. It has phenomenal uh, historical stuff. Nobody knows about it. It's, one of, it's so poor that people don't really appreciate or even know about their history. So this simple exhibit, we had a photographer take photos of all these great places, made a contest. So people coming through, whoever can guess the most places, wins this huge basket of cool stuff. So families come by, what do you think they do? What do kids do? It was cool stuff for kids, too. They grabbed the oldest person in the group, as opposed to that person cutting out, smoking a cigarette, or having coffee, or sneaking a beer, or whatever, uh, if it's not a, uh, you know, alcohol-free place. He becomes the most important person in that group. So it's relevant. That person's experience is helping them win the contest. So you have to think about how do you include everybody? How, how do you include them based on their knowledge? And everybody has, a, has knowledge of the community. It's not just the kids down here. The kids know about the deal on the street. They know what's happening. Okay, and then there's community visioning type activities, uh, planning parks together for all ages. We have uh, examples like that. This is in Calvin Bay. A couple more slides and we'll open it up. Calvin Bay, um, they, uh, Calvin Bay is the north of Wales. It tends to be a, a favorite retirement spot of people from England. They go there for the weather, although it's very rainy there, but just less rainy than in England. <laughs> and people who live in, in Colwyn Bay, they, uh, they tend to feel, uh, people who, who emigrate there, retirees, that they, they still feel like strangers. They're not really getting to know it, getting accepted. So the group there, after we did an intergenerational unity forum, it's like a two-day intensive series of workshops with all kinds of staff and so on. Uh, talking about how do we make this more of an intergenerational, caring, connected place. They came up with uh, walking tours and all kinds of ways to welcome people, family to family welcoming. Uh, and there's potential to put uh, these walks into a virtual web-based walk system so people can learn all about the resources in the area. Okay, last uh, two slides. Uh, we've also done some work with technology with Generations United. So uh, this like 50-page report. It's online. We give it all away. As, 
this extension through extension, which is kind of cool. We don't have to sell everything, um, although some people say you should. But I get away with putting it online. Uh, so we have sections on uh, using technology in ways that um, connect families, they learn family history and so on, uh, community studies, health and wellness, different activities. Uh, what was that? So a uh, community study, look at history pen. I don't know if you know that. Uh, that site is phenomenal. Um, it's a site online. Anybody could go to, to their community. And if you have photos or specific like images, you could pin them on certain places so that it's creating uh, a bridge between your personal experience and the communal experience in the community. Really cool stuff. So, so, so technology has so much potential here. Also, you know, how to, how to, what about uh, families? What about kids not knowing about the gen genealogical roots and so on? Uh, my grandparents are from Russia, I think. I don't even know. I mean, I get my history from uh, Fiddler on the Roof. It's like, <laughs> so I wish I knew more, and I wish, uh, I wish some technology was around that I could have got my older relatives to really uh, put down a lot of stuff. Um, okay, and there's a lot of uh, very fundable items about people being active together, walking together, and how do you stimulate that? So. All right, well, anyway, so the themes I think I, uh, I went over. I think uh, we should definitely open it up here. Oh, all the stuff is on my website, most of it. And uh, Oh, it's over here? And I could give you a card afterwards as well. So um, at any rate, sorry, I'm really just touching a lot of ground, but I'm trying to uh, stimulate some thinking as well. Uh, the last few pages of that handout give some principles, and I think the stories are kind of strong. There's more handouts? Uh, yeah. If not, then we can get them for you or email them to your uh, Okay, yeah, I just made like 30 of them. We made 30. Okay, and it's all online, by the way. I only gave you half of the uh, contact zones thing. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, can we? Yes. Um, thank you so much. I'm a demographer, so I haven't really thought about the distinction between well, the distinction that you set out between all things and intergenerational was extremely helpful to me and been able to take homework. Um, but it also made me think about kind of the difference between what it means to be a just like have a space that's um, supportive of diversity versus inclusivity. Um, and just thinking about demographic shifts in Western Europe and the United States, um, and how in addition to there being well, I guess in addition to age variation, we have kind of this patterns of racial, ethnic, and immigrant diversity across the cohort, right, in the U.S. population, and how that may either complicate or present different challenges in the conceptualization of these places, given that like, older Americans are kind of compositionally different in some ways than the younger cohorts that we're hoping to bring together. And like, how that Wow, that's a big one. What do you think? <laughs> no, that's, a, that's, that's huge. That's huge. Um, it's not easy bringing people of different, uh, you know, different backgrounds together. So uh, you tend to, I pull back on some of the principles of intergenerational work. I mean, you look at what people have in common. People love food. They like families. They want to raise a family. They want to learn, learn things. Uh, and they have a desire to share those stories, share their experience. Uh, many times people are never asked to share, and they have no place to share. And particularly the climate we see happening around in our country and many others is uh, very tense. So um, it, it, is a, it is a hard one. I, I just have, this is a Dutch saying. I, just can't, I don't know the Dutch of it, but I just can't get it out of my mind, that kind of question. Unknown is unloved. So how, how do you get people to know? How, you have to know before you can. Like, who are these people? So how can you meet? How can you find out about it? And how can you share yourself based on how you see yourself as opposed to how you're pegged by other people based on age, your age categorization and some other categorization? So the intergenerational framework or orientation kind of has a lot to say about your set of issues. <laughs> but, but has there been much effort to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, to culturally adapt these programs to different groups, or is that, you know, like an issue? Is it, or is it more sort of one size fits all? Or do people really right, think right. of the inter? Because I hadn't thought of that either about the intersection of culture, and uh, you know, the sort of cultural homophily and then age homophily and discrepancy. Right. 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a huge question with any kind of field. And uh, yeah, you're right, you can't just replicate any particular model, but there are some truths about human experience that you start with. Uh, like one I believe is the truth is that people have stories and there's a certain need to have your story known or to share. Now the stories may differ according to the country and opportunities to share them, people asking you to share them, may, that may differ. But the need for venues to share those stories, I mean, so that's like, that's like one example. Uh, so the intergenerational field is uh, Generations United, U.S., international, international consortium of intergenerational programs. About a dozen countries have these networks. So we meet all the time and, uh, and share what we're doing. We tend not to focus on specific <coughs> models, like through this model. It's more like a way of working and integrating some of the themes into what we're doing. Uh, although there are some, some models, like, uh, and some people are looking for models. They want your model and that's it. I just got a call from somebody in China who wants to do a uh, preschool and adult care shared site. And they want, they're a franchise operation with preschool. And they're looking for something that can franchise fast. So um, my job is, is to uh, convince them that, uh, first of all, there's no perfect one. I think a lot of them are okay or good, but uh, to engage us as a university, maybe as a center that they could help fund, because they're huge, they have like 1,200 sites. <laughs> anyway, I get diverted. Uh, to, to look at, from a Chinese context, what would work best, and actually have a series of meetings and, and iteratively develop a model. And we're not going to spend five years doing that, because we're into translational research as well and, and working with teams. So um, at any rate, so that's, I guess, my my thoughts on that. That's a, that's a hard question, but definitely you can't just take one thing and apply it everywhere. Uh, yes? In, in, in following up on your saying that people like their stories to be known, whatever they know, it's also the case that when we're 40 or 50 and the people are no longer around to ask, that's when we decide that we want to know those things. So one of the things this program can do is promote in younger people some interest in trying to find out the things <laughs> while people are still around and get done with Exactly. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of pain. I talk about if this is relevant in any country. I've seen it relevant in every context. I did a meeting in Japan. I thought, I felt very out of place. I was never in, this is like about 20 years ago. It was a meeting of millionaire older adults trying to cash in on the demographic shift towards aging. So what do I have in common with those people, I thought. Anyway, there's this guy coughing right next to me. He was very ill, he was like in his 80s. His handkerchief had some blood in it, so he was very, really unwell. And eventually, he shared a story. He was a, uh, and this was a long time ago. Uh, he was, um, I forget the name, the proper appropriate name, but we would call it like a kamikaze pilot or whatever in World War II, right before his number was called. So that's his story, and there's a lot of pain with that. And as we know from his perspective, there's a lot to share. But nobody in Japan would want to hear that. And in fact, people of that generation were kind of ostracized and so on. But the pain in his face, the lines in his face, I mean, it was kind of uh, painful even for him to talk about it. So I, I think, and also considering that the armed forces in Japan really needed help at that time to rebuild it, I kind of suggested to somebody in the U.S. consulate that maybe you could have some kind of interaction. They almost like kicked me out of the country to mention that, because I mean, it's cultural, intentional cultural discontinuity, which we could understand. But at any rate, we need to build bridges and opportunities. The pain we have when, when your stories don't mean anything to anyone else, and the glee, you see somebody's story become known, the, the, the opening up, the mental and physical health implications of being socially connected in that way are huge. Okay, anyway, I think we have time for one, more, one or two more questions. Anything from the technology people? Can you help us design virtual meeting spaces? Yeah, holograms, good. Holograms. Good, good. Um, all right, we're going to go back. Oh, we have a question here. Sorry. Well, if we have time, we'll get back to the demographics first. So, so I hear tech, and that's not what I represent. I represent Community Foundation, and we do fundraising for the Community Foundation. And I think it's really by the community. And hearing some of these things, it's so true in thinking about how we can partner together to make a meaningful change and difference. And a lot of it for our role is bringing that um, form a place of education, you know, a place for collaboration. So when you talk about the intergenerational connection, how do you see that meaningful um, for a 
opportunity to come together and fund particular things that benefit many. Yeah, I, I think we, uh, one of the chapters of the book, it's not in the ones that I cut over here, I mean in that series of papers, it was written by, uh, oh, the same again, the guy from Partners for Livable, for Livable Communities, Mc, Mc something. Uh, Robert McNulty, Culture is Animator of Intergenerational Gathering Places. He's done tons of research of communities and cities around the world, and his whole thing is about meeting spaces. And he got very excited about the, the explicit intergenerational uh, engagement theme. And he taught, he's, and his chapter talks about like the Queens Museum, you know, library, all these cultural institutions that are perfect places for meeting. However, they're not, uh, they're not all so perfect, although those are the examples he talks about do wonderful things. And then there are, there are sites that you don't think about. It could be a bus stop, but um, also shared sites. I think in, you have an, uh, an intergenerational uh, retirement community, right? Doesn't uh, Ithaca College has one, right? Yeah, I mean, that, those places, I mean, that, those are like living, learning laboratories. And the fact that they're connected with universities, I think that's really uh, great. And actually, some of these objects, I think I just, try to pique your interest. I mean, I, I think there are all kinds of research, uh, action research type projects that can be uh, explored in those things. And I think they'd be receptive. I mean, it can't just be, uh, you know, the eating alternative like birds, kids, and plants, like throwing at people. Not that they're throwing at other people, but some places do that. And it's, yeah, so at any rate, I mean, I think there are many, where there, there's many, uh, there's much that could be done in terms of layering and trying things out. And Ithaca is the right place for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to be the yeah. one to cut things off. I do say that we're hoping that MAP will have sort of an ongoing relationship with us and continue to serve as a resource person. And feel free to um, stay and chat a bit if your question um, wasn't answered. Uh, um, and thanks again for joining us. Okay. okay.